We're going to give ourselves 60 more seconds before we get the program started. Is that okay? For my panel? Y ahorita, en el momento que estamos esperando, si ustedes hablan español, If pueden you... seleccionar uh, su canal a propiedad que es de español. Si sabes cómo unirse a ese canal, puedes empezar, empujar el globito que está en tu pantalla. Si estás en una computadora, la va a estar abajo en tu pantalla. Vas a mirar el globito y vas a mirar la opción de oprimir Spanish y puedes oír en español lo que está pasando. Si estás unándote por teléfono, tu smartphone, puedes imprimir tu pantalla y vas a mirar los mirar el globito allí. So just letting Spanish speaking folks know that if they want to access Spanish interpretation, they can go ahead and select the globe at the bottom of their screen if they're joining via computer. And if they're joining via smartphone, they can press the screen on their phones and access the options that way. Okay, we can go ahead and clear down for what? For a candidate forum, that's for what? So good evening to everyone that's here with us tonight. This is wonderful. Anytime you can get engaged in the political process, it's a great time. So uh, we're here tonight to talk to some amazing candidates, to hear from them and um, listen to them, tell us about their platforms, what they're about, why they should be our next candidate for 8018. And thank you for everyone for showing up. But I first have to give thanks, of course, as the director of ACE Oakland, um, to my members and all of the ACE family from around the state of California, uh, for the people that are on as panelists right now, but all of the people who couldn't make it tonight, shout out to ACE, to all the Killer B family, and also to the Courage Campaign for being our partner and um, making this event happen tonight. My name is Carol Fife. Um, I am the director of ACE Action Oakland and ACE Institute. And tonight is an exercise in democracy. And we are going to um, give the, op give the uh, candidates an opportunity to talk about the issues. Our attendees will be able to directly contribute through questions and direct discussion. And we are going to get some information on the, can the campaign that's coming up on June 29th. It's right around the corner. So it's important that folks get engaged. Um, this forum is being recorded, so make sure that you're comfortable with that. Only the panelists that are speaking tonight will be displayed. This is a webinar format. And um, yeah, I think Juan, you already described the, the Spanish interpretation. Is there anything else you need to say about that? Maybe I can just explain it one more time for folks who might have joined late. Yes, please. Entonces, si ustedes quieren oír lo que está pasando en español, Pueden unirse al canal de español. Si estás en computadora, puedes mirar el globito abajo y dice interpretation y puedes oprimir ese globito y seleccionar donde dice Spanish y puedes oír nuestro interpretador Guillermo. Okay? Y si estás en una smartphone, en tu teléfono, puedes oprimir la pantalla, vas a mirar las opciones y vas a mirar el globito que dice interpretation y otra vez puedes poner su uh, selección de canal. Spanish, okay? Gracias, gracias. So next we will have Irene for some logistics, housekeeping, and some land acknowledgements. Irene. Thank you, Carol. Good evening, everyone. My name is Irene Gao. I'm the Executive Director of Courage California. Um, so as Carol mentioned, we really want this candidate forum to be a place where you can engage with the three candidates that we've invited on for this evening. So if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see that there is a little function here with the two um, talker messaging boxes um, labeled Q&A. And so you can submit questions that you want candidates to potentially answer um, at any time. Um, and I'll be sort of moderating that. Additionally, we've gotten some questions from some of you um, already through your registrations. Um, uh, full disclosure, I'm actually a resident of the district, so I was really heartened to see a lot of the questions you guys asked. You guys asked some good, tough questions, and I'm really glad I'm not running in this race. 
Um, but at any time, chat your questions into the Q and A. So next, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge our presence on the traditional and unceded territory of the Ohlone people who are the traditional caretakers of this land we call Oakland. Um, as visitors on this land, we pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, relatives, and future generations. And sorry, I should have also included San Leandro and Alameda as well. Um, so as Juan and Carol mentioned, I'm just gonna briefly introduce our two co-hosting organizations. As I mentioned, I'm with Courage California. Uh, and we provide the tools needed to unite with communities organizing for progressive change, expose the forces of corruption, and hold our representatives to account in order to ensure that California's elected officials act with courage. We have over a million uh, members across California and the nation. Um, and I will turn it over to Chris Jackson with ACE to introduce ACE. Hi, good evening, everyone. So something that's been personal for me and for a lot of folks um you know in Oakland so um thank you for being here and um we look forward to hearing um as a resident of the assembly district too look forward to hearing um your views on some of our issues Right on, thank you so much, Chris. Um, hi everybody, my name is Nicole Dean. I'm the Deputy Director of ACE Oakland and I'm just gonna go over how this forum is gonna work tonight. And then I'm gonna introduce our moderator, which is my pleasure to do. So this forum will last until 8 p.m. It will begin with the candidates opening statements. Candidates will have two minutes for their opening statement. The starting order will be based on last name alphabetical order. So Mia Bonta will be going first, then Janani Ramachandran will be going second, and Malia Veya will be going third. The candidates will also be allowed closing statements at the end. The forum organizers have prepared some questions to ask the candidates. And there will also be an opportunity for candidates to answer questions directly from the audience. Um, and so remember the way to do that is to use the Q&A feature. And also if you submitted questions um, during your Zoom registration, your question will probably be asked. Candidates will have 90 seconds to answer a question. If a candidate goes over time, the moderator will interject. So now to give a fuller introduction of the moderator for the evening. Our moderator for today's panel is Carol Fife, ACE Oakland director, a Moms for Housing organizer and Oakland District 3 city council member. Carol has galvanized an international movement to decommodify housing because housing is a human right. She has fought back against police terrorism and helped to build a network of black organizations and individuals working together for community self-determination. Carol has worked behind the scenes in Oakland electoral politics for over a decade as the founder of Black Women in Elected Leadership and an elected member of the Oakland NAACP's Executive Committee. Since 2014, she has managed several campaigns, including Oakland's first ever slate of all Black women candidates for city council and the OUSD school board, she was a 2016 and 2020 delegate for Bernie Sanders and is a member of the 2020 platform committee for the DNC. She's the future of American politics. Thank God. <laughs> she gives us so much hope. Um, she loves us and she fights for justice. Please make some noise in the chat for Carol Fife. Thank you, Nicole. That was so sweet. That was so sweet. And I just want to give a shout out to Nicole, Nicole Dean for modeling the pace at which we should be speaking tonight to uh, be respectful of translation so that things go smoothly. Thank you, Nicole, for that modeling and also for being a G organizer. I just wanted to throw that in there too. 
So tonight um, we are going to hear from three candidates and we will go alphabetically. And so we will give the candidates opening statement remarks and two minutes each. So if we can make sure that our timekeeper is on deck, we can go ahead and get started with Mia Bonta. Thank you so much. I'm Mia Bonta. I'm the daughter of a socialist father and a Democrat activist mother who named me after a revolutionary, leaving some pretty big shoes to fill. Uh, as activists, my parents were making the same demands for justice that the Black Panthers were making here in Oakland, policing the police, a right to housing, food security, and equity in education, issues that 50 years later we're still fighting for. My parents taught me about the power of being an advocate through service, and I've been fighting for our children and East Bay communities for over 25 years. I come to my work in our community, not from theory or a lens, but from my own lived experience. And I see myself in so many of our young brothers and sisters. I grew up experiencing what it was like to watch a strong black Latina woman have to make trade-offs at the end of the month between paying the rent, paying a doctor's bill or pit putting food on the table. I worked my way through college and law school and still graduated with over $154,000 of student loan debt with my partner in life and partner in service. I'm working for the East Bay Children and Families, and I've seen our community displaced, dismissed, and dying at the hands of supposed protectors and trapped by systems that were not built to see us succeed. I set up my business in West Oakland. I was proud to be able to be a part of the West Oakland community in that way. And, and now I'm a school board president in Alameda, and I work every day to fulfill the promise of scholarships and college opportunity for Oakland's children. I'm running for assembly because we here in 8018 can no longer be displaced from the state house. The East Bay has not seen a black woman to Sacramento since the Honorable Barbara, Barbara Lee, and it is such an honor to have her endorsement. I'm running because we have a lot of work to do and our representation, our experience and our voice matters now more than ever. Thank you so much for having me join a part of, and be a part of this forum. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you for those statements. Janani, and I apologize if I say your name wrong, I just call you Janani. Um, can you please help me with that so I don't botch it? Janani. And your last name? Ramachandran. Ramachandran. There we go. So Janani, you're up next. Good evening, everyone. My name is Janani Ramachandran. I'm an activist, social justice attorney, and proud member of three different Oakland tenant unions. And if elected, I would be just one out of three tenants out of 120 state lawmakers. I was driven to run for this seat because of the community members that I supported who were experiencing evictions during this pandemic. Elderly Oaklanders, survivors of domestic violence, children with disabilities. And these families, like tens of thousands across California in this past year, were evicted because our moratorium, which expires just one day after this special election, did not go far enough. I am driven to run for this seat because while fighting alongside state tenant unions and movements like ACE for a stronger moratorium and to cancel the rental debt, while sharing stories of pain of our community members to our supposedly progressive lawmakers, their responses were consistently a resounding, that's sad, but no, I'm not going to try to do anything about it because the corporate interests are just too strong. I promise to never use the excuse of saying, I'm not going to try to fight because it's too hard. So I am fighting for a true eviction moratorium during the post-pandemic recovery to repeal Costa-Hawkins and the Ellis Act, to enact a right to counsel, to develop a 10-year plan for homelessness. And I'm proud to be supported by organizations that also believe it's time to center the voices of tenants who makes up 60% of this district, including Oakland Tenants Union, the California Democratic Party Progressive Caucus, Our Revolution, ILWU, Oakland East Bay Democratic Club, multiple former Black Panthers, tenant and unhoused community activists and faith leaders, and so much others. So join us to fight back against developers and landlord lobbies, center our voices, and take back our power. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. And the next final speaker for tonight is Malia Vea. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, 
I too am an activist. I'm also a workers' rights attorney. I am a professor at Mills College and the vice mayor of the city of Alameda. Some of you may think city of Alameda, wow, uh, there's so much more we need to do there. Uh, that's exactly what I thought back in 2016 when I decided to run and take out an incumbent who was voting for things that were for policies that were displacing many of our black and brown community members. That's exactly what I thought when I saw uh, late at night, city council staying up until four o'clock in the morning so that they could silence the vast majority of tenants in my community. And I thought, if not me, then who? Who's gonna be there to represent regular working people? Who's going to be there to represent folks who have six figures in student loan debt who are just trying to make it and stay in their chosen communities? That's why I ran for city council and with a grassroots campaign, I took out an incumbent. And in my time in office, I made change and I made change fast. We enacted a minimum wage ahead of the state of California. We became a sanctuary city ahead of the state of California. I personally uh, took place, uh, took part in making sure that we were doing know your rights clinics uh, ahead of uh, President Trump getting inaugurated. Uh, and beyond that, we also made sure that we enacted meaningful tenant protections like a rent cap, legal counsel for tenants, and making sure that we had just cause eviction protections. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, I made sure that the city of Alameda passed a moratorium that was far more expansive than the state of California, and that we built affordable and workforce housing. I'm endorsed by Oakland Rising Action, Bay Rising Action, the Coalition on Police Accountability, Latino Task Force, the Women's Legislative Caucus, and a number of tenant activists because I have enacted the progressive policies we all care about. And that's exactly what I want to champion when I go to Sacramento and represent this district. All right, you all, we got through the introductions and I just want to say as an individual who just went through this process and was only recently elected and started um, working in office in January, it's not easy to get all of your thoughts in in two minutes and it will not be easy to get all of their responses in in the 90 seconds that they have to answer the questions that are following. So we're moving into section one, the Q&A prepared questions. So candidates will have 90 seconds to answer questions and our member um, from ACE Oakland will be asking. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Elliot Williams um, and Irene from Courage to start our questions. Thank you, Carol. Um, so of course I'm gonna start with um, if each of the candidates could answer, what are your top three priority issues in your campaign and quickly why? And we'll start with Mia. Uh, top three, three priorities for me are first, making sure that we have an equitable COVID recovery. That means uh, not only from a health perspective, but also from an economic perspective, as far too many of us have been impacted uh, in terms of housing, uh, economic recovery, our right to our jobs and, uh, and health within that, as well as education. Uh, second priority for me is ensuring that we have an ability to reopen our schools. When we closed our schools, we closed on our economy and we put too much on the, to bear for parents and families to have to be able to support their children in that moment. And that includes transforming education so it's stronger from childcare education all the way to, to, to post-secondary opportunities for all of our children. And thirdly, to be able to get at some of the core root issues that we're experiencing uh, in this district in particular related to uh, addressing homelessness and affordable housing. Thank you, Mia. And then that question next goes to uh, Janani. Um, first, housing is a human right. Second, workers deserve a living wage. And finally, community safety begins with us. Firstly, I'm not just saying housing is a human right like many of our political leaders. I wanna take specific actions to repeal the laws that make sure that housing is currently a commodity rather than a human right, including by repealing the Ellis Act and Costa Hawkins, two initiatives I've worked on as a tenants rights attorney and advocate, extending our eviction, eviction moratorium um, and funding affordable housing through a wealth tax. Uh, second, living wages. I want to raise the minimum wage to $22 an hour because it is unacceptable that half of Californians who live in poverty actually work a full-time job. Absolutely no one should be living in poverty, including those who work full-time jobs. And finally, 
community safety is not defined by our carceral system. We have poured in, um, we pour in millions of dollars every year to fund systems that do not keep us safe, to fund systems that have allowed 1,172 people to be killed by police last year. So I will work to pass legislation that supports the growth of organizations, including those that I work with in this district, like MH First, like Men Creating Peace, like the San Quentin Restorative Justice project and others that do the meaningful work to support our communities and get to the roots of violence rather than put a band-aid on it by a racist and unjust carceral systems. Thank you and Malia. Housing uh, is a top priority, making sure that we have enough affordable housing and workforce housing for our community members, making sure that when we build new housing, uh, it's not displacing folks who are in rent controlled units, making sure that we have meaningful tenant protections statewide, making sure that we have uh, things in place to prevent displacement like legal uh, representation for our tenants uh, and making sure that we're providing services uh, to keep, uh, to help our folks who are unhoused uh, and to, to make sure that there is a seamless transition rather amongst services rather than uh, cold handoffs. Um, my second uh, priority is addressing climate change. We have to do it. Uh, we have to do it now. And we need to make sure that whatever we do, uh, it takes into account a, a lens on equity and justice and making sure that whatever we do, we have representation from all of our community members uh, so that uh, when we enact these policy changes, we're not disproportionately affecting or impacting communities that have already been hit the hardest. Uh, and finally, equity. I think it's really important that we disrupt this growing wealth gap that's occurring, make sure that corporations pay their fair share and make sure that when we, when we tax corporations, properly. We're reinvesting in things like education and the social services that we know help people stay out of poverty and help uplift our community members that need help. Um, so that's really what I want to focus on. So question two for our housing section will be asked by ACE member Christine Miller. Uh, hi, this is uh, Christine Miller. Oh. Hi, this is Christine Miller, and um, I'm an ACE member. I've been ACE with ACE for five years, and I'd like to ask of all three members, um, uh, candidates, what would you do to ensure the repel the repeal of Costa Hawkins and the Ellis Act? Thank you, Christine. First, I'd, yeah. Uh, I don't know the position of the, who's supposed to ask first. We'll start with Janani and then we'll go to Malia and right. then. Firstly, with regard to Costa Hawkins, I am shocked. I mean, I'm dismayed that Prop 21 passed, but I think it's about our messaging. We need to show Californians that, um, and our state lawmakers that Costa Hawkins is not a tool to constrain cities. It's a tool that's gonna free up the abilities of cities like Oakland who want to expand rent control, to, who want to expand rent control to single family homes and expand um, vacancy control. With regard to, and it's about messaging, which unfortunately developers and corporations hijacked in the last election. With regard to the Ellis Act, I was a part of the coalition that spearheaded the legislation that was introduced by Alex Lee, AB 854, um, an assembly member who's endorsing me in this race, and helped build a broad-based coalition across the East Bay to get it on the table in the first place. Oakland Law, there are so many individuals in the course of this pandemic that I've personally worked at who were evicted during this pandemic because of the Ellis Act. There are jurisdictions across California that didn't know what the Ellis Act was, but because it was one of the greatest loopholes and the easiest loopholes for landlords to use was a tool to evict long-term rent control tenants. And the way that I want to um, advocate for it is by making sure that AB 854 passes and by making sure that more individuals are aware of the havoc that it's wreaked, not only in cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles, but all across California. Malia? 
Um, I was part of the group that was circulating signatures, trying to make sure uh, that we could actually educate people uh, around Prop 10, making sure that folks uh, knew what they were voting on when we were trying to repeal Costa Hawkins in full. I was sad that that didn't pass, um, but I think we're doing all of the things that we need to do, which is we've seen uh, the, the grassroots swell, the ground swell of uh, tenants getting together and community activists getting together to really call to question uh, what our legislature is doing and why they are not taking action uh, and supporting us in terms of making sure that we have the protections we need. So I think um, you know working in coalition and continuing to work in coalition with folks like Leah Simon Weisberg, with ACE, uh, with our different uh, action groups, statewide to really put pressure on folks and to really educate them because what's happening is a lot of our legislators are listening to the special interests that have their ear in Sacramento and they are not listening to their constituents in their district. If they did, we would see these changes. Um, we need to stop legislating at the ballot box on these really critical issues because it's keeping a lot of people out and confusing the issue. I wholeheartedly support the repeal of Costa Hawkins as I have in the past. I have not changed my position on that. And I also support repealing the Ellis Act. It's gotta go and it's creating a lot of issues uh, and that we have to legislate around and it's not protecting all of our community members the same. Thank you. And before we have Mia speak, I would just remind all of our panelists tonight to slow down a little bit so that we have the ability for the translators to get in what you're saying and capture everything. So thank you. And Mia. Can you all hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I also support the full repeal of Costa Hawkins and the full repeal of the Ellis Act uh, as we need to. The way that we're going to be able to get that done, though, is by ensuring that the 18 million Californians who rent the place that they call home are actually able to be centered in the conversation. Uh, legislators know, and for years, for decades, have treated Costa Hawkins, the repeal of Costa Hawkins and the repeal of the Ellis Act as the, as the legislative third rail. Uh, so we're dealing with people who uh, have been focused on on, uh, on housing production in, in a way that doesn't center tenants in that. So we need to ensure uh, that tenants are at the table, that they're focused on protecting uh, our displacement, unjust evictions, unaffordable rents, and other affronts to our dignity, livelihood, security, and safety. I, as somebody who was a renter for 30 years, who experienced uh, the kind of, uh, uh, of lecherous landlords and, and evictions that came at the hands of, of, of landlords who were able to take advantage of proposals like the Ellis Act, uh, know full well what happens when you don't have tenants at the table. So one is make sure that tenants are at the table. Two is make sure that you're actually talking to and building coalitions, not only amongst legislators, uh, but amongst community groups so that those voices can be heard um, you don't get that by shouting out in a corner alone. You get that by making sure that you're understanding what legislators are facing in their own districts uh, and creating a common cause around the need to be able to support our 18 million Californians who are experiencing uh, rental injustice. And thank you all for those answers. And we are moving on to question three that will be asked by ACE member Kathy Galanos. Yes, um, even as people lost income during the pandemic through no fault of their own, tenants found themselves continuing to owe rent month after month. This has left many renters in rent debt or in a situation where they have turned to using credit cards or other forms of loans to make monthly rent. What is your view about what should be done to address rent debt and credit debt? And before we get into the order of that question, my ink was smeared. That is Katie, not Kathy. I just wanted to clarify that. And so the order of speakers on this question are Malia, Mia, and then Janani. There's a couple things that we have to do. One is that we need to make sure that the rent relief that the state has set aside is actually distributed in a culturally competent manner utilizing our community-based organizations that already have 
uh, the relationships and making sure uh, that we streamline the process a little more. We can't just depend on people, one, knowing that they're entitled to relief, and two, uh, that it's also only available essentially by going online. Many of our most vulnerable community members uh, need outreach in their native language. They need outreach with uh, partners in the community that they trust and have a relationship with, uh, and they need the process simplified and streamlined, not where they have to jump through a bunch of hoops uh, and where all of the money essentially goes to the landlord. So we need to expand the type of relief that we're giving and make sure that we're uh, distributing it in a culturally competent manner. Uh, additionally, we need to make sure that the non-payment of rent during the pandemic uh, is not used to hurt an individual's uh, credit score or is something that could be used against renters in the future as they try to find new housing or secure housing. Um, so the state of California has an obligation to address that aspect of things too and can't just say, we're gonna provide relief. Um, the relief also needs to expand to things uh, like reimbursements uh, for uh, utilities or things like that where tenants had to pay with their credit card because they weren't sure if they were gonna get a reimbursement for it. So we need to expand what the relief is used for uh, and make sure that it also covers other debt that tenants have taken on related to housing and related to their needs during the pandemic because we did not successfully roll out EDD in a way uh, that was accessible to folks. I'm sorry, I had to take a water break because I'm coughing, <clears throat> but please for the next question, it goes to Mia. I think one of the things that I faced, I actually paid for my rent several times uh, using my credit card and did that cashback thing that put me into more debt uh, when I was in my twenties. So I know this situation all too well. I think one of the things that the state needs to do is expand out the rent relief program to ensure that it also includes the ability to pay, pay for utility programming. Uh, I, uh, utilities because they're all the more costly and what will end up showing up on on credit card debts. I think that the city that the state has the ability to be able to work uh, through renters uh, and with uh, creditors to ensure that those debts are are automatically waived uh, and, and 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 renters can apply uh, any rent subsidies to uh, to their credit cards with ease of process. Uh, there's a lot of friction in the system that keeps renters from being able to access the kinds of services and supports that they need. And one of the things that the state can do well, if it puts its mind to it, is uh, get rid of that friction. I think that there's tension in the way that the, the EDD has worked um, with different rental subsidy programs, uh, and that's a problem. And finally, I think we also need to invest significantly into the infrastructure that is our nonprofit support system, the fourth arm of government that are actually the first responders first on the ground and frontliners working with people who are experiencing rental uh, rental relief, needing rental relief and uh, experiencing issues related to rent debt and credit debt to be able to support them. Thank you all for those answers. And we are moving on to our fourth question. Oh, sorry, I didn't get to answer. Oh, I apologize, please, Jenny. Um, the reality is that less than 40% of tenants who've owed rental debt during this pandemic got any kind of relief. In some counties, as low as 2% of tenants who owed rental debt got relief. I've been part of coalitions like ACE who said from day one that SB 91 was flawed, but no, we didn't even get a chance to argue the merits of AB 15 on the assembly floor. We said it was going to be, SB 91 was going to be used as a tool to evict long-term rent control tenants, and that is unfortunately exactly what's happening now. So what I would do is firstly cancel rental debt for all individuals during the pandemic through a true rent relief program. I've signed on to Oakland's petition for to make housing a human right and would advocate for pro, uh, petitions like this at the state level. Secondly, I would address landlord coercion, which is a large part of the reason why tenants could not take advantage of SB 91 during this pandemic. Evictions are not just about a notice at your door. It's about the subliminal threats to you, your credit scores, your future 
future ability to rent, and that's not being addressed by legislation. Third, I would make sure that we have provisions to ensure that rental debt owed during the pandemic does not um, affect credit scores, which SB 91 does not do thoroughly enough, and mask all evictions that have happened um, due to pandemic-related debt. And finally, I would fight for a right to counsel to litigate these issues eventually or negotiate with landlords because we know that enough individuals are going to be evicted, and it's unjust that 90% of landlords have an attorney and 90% of tenants don't. Thank you for sharing that. I apologize. And <clears throat> I will make sure that that doesn't happen again, but thank you for your responses. And um, up next, we have Norma Sanchez from ACE Oakland. Do we have Norma? Yes, lo <laughs> siento. Uh, okay. Um, buenas tardes a todos. Yo soy Norma Sánchez, pertenezco a um, ACE uh, en Oakland. Um, este, yo, le, la, los activistas de la justicia de la vivienda han estado promoviendo cada vez más los fideicomisos de tierra como, buen, como un buen modelo de garantizar el acceso de viviendas permanent, permanentemente accesibles donde la tierra residencial es, a, es propiedad de una entidad comunal o organización sin fines de lucro y las viviendas se hacen la prioridad de los miembros de la comunidad. Yo les quiero hacer una pregunta. ¿Hasta qué punto lucharían para financiar los fideicomisos de tierra como una opción para promover viviendas accesibles en el distrito? Gracias, Norma. And I will go ahead and uh, interpret uh, what Norma was just asking. And as a reminder, we're still in the housing section of our Q and A. Uh, and Norma is introducing herself as an ACE member. And her question was uh, that housing justice advocates have increasingly been turning to land trusts as a model meant to ensure the availability of permanently affordable housing where residential land is owned by a nonprofit or communal entity and the housing is made available to members of the community. And her question is, to what extent would you fight to fund land trusts as an option for promoting affordable housing in the district? And the order of those questions will be Mia, Janani, and Malia. I think a public land trusts are a, a wonderful tool uh, that has uh, that has been underutilized to ensure that we can keep residents in their homes. Uh, we know that the mortgage financing in the way that it's structured right now doesn't allow for people to be able to, uh, to purchase a home and it certainly doesn't allow for people to stay in their home when they need to be able to do that. Uh, recognizing that we need over 185,000 low income rental units in Alameda County, we need to make sure that we're building affordable housing, transit oriented housing, uh, and that doesn't displace and gentrify housing. So uh, community uh, land trusts allow us a, a vehicle that has not been made widely available to be able to do this. Uh, we need to be able to fund this as part of the $12.5 billion that, um, that the state is dedicating towards uh, housing areas to make it one of the prongs that we have the ability to use to ensure that uh, people, particularly people of color who have uh, been left out of the financing system uh, out of uh, out of the banking system entirely to be able to ensure that they have uh, the resource to be able to use a, a land trust as a, a very viable option to be able to ensure that they can stay in their homes, purchase homes, uh, and stay landed. Janani, um, I absolutely support both the growth and expansion of community land trusts like, like the ones we have um, in Oakland. To me, they're a powerful tool to help take housing out of the capitalist speculative market 
and allow a sense of equity in housing and embrace models that are rooted in cultural values. And my interest with community land trusts in particular is to focus on preservation and stewardship to enable land trusts to purchase naturally occurring housing as they're sold, as they're released from their owners to make sure that they don't reach the speculative market because we know that market speculators are a huge part of the reason why land prices are, are, are so high, why the cost of living is so high and why people are evicted through evictions like the Ellis Act. And um, in order to fund this type of program, um, you know, ironically using the capitalist structure by imposing a wealth tax on all individuals who make over uh, $50 million a year, who have a net worth of about $50 million a year. Um, I also believe we need to fund these programs through redevelopment dollars and enable um, the return of redevelopment dollars to cities to be able to, to decide how to use um, this funding to both build affordable housing and support community land trusts like the ones that we have right here in Oakland. And Malia. Having served on city council, uh, I've sat through a number of conversations with our housing providers, uh, our housing authority uh, and city staff uh, asking questions like, why are we only moving forward with one project this year when we have all of this other financing, we're only missing a couple million dollars. Uh, and the answer that I've gotten repeatedly is that our projects compete against each other. We need to change how we are funding affordable housing. Uh, it makes zero sense that we have projects that are 80 or 90% financed uh, in our public housing programs that exist that we, are, that we are saying, no, you have to hold off. And then we see the cost of construction increase and we see the demand increase. Uh, so I wholeheartedly support public housing. I wholeheartedly support our community land trusts. I just think that we need to change how we are funding things that we're not competing against ourselves for dollars. The state needs to actually fund things uh, from the beginning. There's opportunities to do so in our job centers. We need corporate taxes. They're creating demands for housing. They should be paying for that housing. We also need to better leverage our developer impact fees to make sure that we're getting more out of these projects. We're getting the inclusionary housing that we need. And then we also need to work to make sure that they don't get around rent control by asking for condo maps and condoizing without including BMR units that then go into our community land trusts. Additionally, we need to utilize our lead paint settlement money. Once again, thank you all for those answers. And our, our next question, and I just also want to give a shout out to Norma for her question. Oftentimes we don't make the space necessary for um, bilingual speakers. And we try to ensure that we do that at ACE Action. And um, so I just want to thank you for your question. And if people have concerns or questions about uh, those things, direct them to the uh, moderators and not at the panelists, thank you. Um, that said, we are going to our next question um, to be asked by an ACE member about TOPA. And I'm not clear on which member is asking. I'll be Norma again. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Bueno, pues mi pregunta es esta. Sabemos que um, la vivienda, el techo es un derecho humano, ¿verdad? Uh -huh. Entonces, um, y también sabemos que hay muchos, muchos uh, homeless y, y creo que la solución sería con topa, porque ellos... Um, todos los, todas las, um, ¿cómo puedo explicar? Todos los inquilinos tendrían el privilegio de ser dueños de su propia casa. El ejemplo está aquí, que soy yo. Yo soy el fideicomiso de tierras y queremos luchar para que haya 
ese fondo para poder adquirir más viviendas accesibles por medio de topa, por medio de que nosotros tengamos primero el privilegio de adquirir nuestra vivienda antes que todo, porque hay muchas injusticias, muchos desalojos y por este medio eh, podemos adquirir viviendas accesibles. ¿Ustedes qué harían para adquirir fondos para más viviendas o para comprar hoteles? ¿Qué harían ustedes? Gracias otra vez, Norma. So I'm going to go ahead and do my best to try to translate what Norma was asking. Uh, this uh, question is in reference to a local Oakland ordinance, Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, also known as TOPA. Uh, she says, uh, Norma says, housing is a human right. There are many unhoused folks. Uh, one solution to make sure that people have housing could come in the form of TOPA. Um, all renters under this ordinance would have the opportunity to become owners of their own homes. Uh, for example, Norma is in a similar situation since she lives in a land trust. Uh, what TOPA would do and the related funding would do is it would help tenants have the first opportunity to own the home they live in if the owner chooses to sell it. So before it goes to the free market, it would go to the current occupants first. Um, so the question is, even though this is a local matter, I guess extrapolating to the statewide um, as well, is um, what would you do to fund this type of program, uh, either with residential property or perhaps uh, hotels being converted as well? Thank you, Norma, and thank you, Juan. And the order of those um, answering this question are Janani. Malia and Mia. And I want to also articulate that TOPA is moving in Alameda County and more than just the city of Oakland. So I want to be clear on that. And um, we can go ahead and take answers. Thank you so much for your question, Norma. Good to see you again. And I wholeheartedly support TOPA because it is essential to land preservation, which is essential to anti-displacement so our community members can stop getting gentrified out of their own neighborhoods. And it's a tool to enable people to achieve the dream of home ownership through programs that allow tenants to have the first, the right of first refusal. And this is essential because we still have not repealed Costa Hawkins. Cities don't have the ability to implement vacancy control so that when a unit is um, uh, passed on to a new owner and when tenants do move out of a unit for whatever reason, that the landlords have full ability to make that very unit market rate. So we cannot, under our current system, keep low-income units or affordable housing units or long-term rent control units affordable. And to me, TOPA is a part of the solution to racist redlining policies. You know, with our... Um, with Black communities leaving open, Oakland, with many communities of color, color leaving, leaving Oakland, we need to start taking proactive measures in the way that in hist in historically we did to white, to white low-income communities when it came to squatters' rights. We need to reverse the legacy of racism in um, allowing individuals to get on a path to home ownership, which currently is our status quo. And I would fund it through both the wealth tax and the land speculator tax. Thank you. And our next um, question will be answered by, well, this question will be answered by Malia. Thank you. For many of us, uh, you know, we have been kept out of property ownership uh, and it's a form of oppression that has continued. Our country was founded not on the concept of housing as a human right, but on the concept of commodities and property ownership. That is the founding principles of our constitution. Uh, and so, you know, the barriers that we have continued to put up, uh, you know, relative to allowing pathways for people to own property, communities of color in particular, 
uh, is, you know, we need to address them. And so that's why I wholeheartedly support TOPA. Uh, it curbs displacement, it creates um, continuity in our communities. And most importantly, it allows for our communities to actually gain equity and have wealth uh, that we can pass on to future generations. Um, so I think there's a few things that we need to do. Uh, we need to expand our Cal HFA program, which is our down, our, our, uh, down payment assistance program that we have. We can do that through a number of different things, including a wealth tax, which is why I support the wealth tax uh, that is being carried by Assembly Member Alex Lee and has become a two-year bill. He's, he's also supporting my campaign. Uh, we can leverage the funds from Project Home Key to make sure that we are actually purchasing uh, these hotels and converting them and then creating pathways to home ownership. Uh, for uh, the tenants who are there. Uh, additionally, we need to explore public banking. And our last speaker on this question, Mia Bonta. We all know that one of the ways that we're able to uh, accumulate wealth is through home ownership. It's something that uh, because of the kind of redlining and exclusionary practices that we've experienced, particularly in this district, we haven't been able to uh, take advantage of that wealth accumulation, but through home ownership. So I am in full support of TOPA and believe that there's an ability to take the model that Oakland has uh, really spearheaded and make it something that we can rely on across the state of California, particularly in areas where um, uh, that are far less progressive than than we are in this district to be able to ensure we have the ability to do that. I think uh, we need to be able to look at creating alternate financing structures, one by ensuring that we have a pathway to be able to support um, uh, that first right of refusal when a, ten when a, when a tenant wants to become the, a homeowner of the place that they called home for so long, they have the ability to in, uh, receive uh, uh, revolving loan uh, financing mechanisms that would allow them to be able to have um, a, a loan um, that would take into account um, their a, a different structure in terms of the amount of funds that they had available for deposit, um, their credit score, their credit history, uh, because unfortunately, um, down payments in this in in our district are far too high for anyone to be able to absorb independently. So we need to ensure that the state is paying for. Uh, we need to ensure that the state is paying for uh, ability to have alternative mortgaging and financing structures to en enable expansion of TOPA. Thank you, and right on time at that. Thank you. And our next question will be asked by Irene from Courage, California. Thank you, Carol. So now several of you have mentioned how bills have either been killed or amended or moved to two-year bills. So I'd love to hear what do you think needs to be done to get more um, bills that you know people in our communities are demanding to actually get them passed in Sacramento? So the order for these answers will be Malia, Mia, and then Janani. We need champions in the state legislature that are gonna do more than just sign on and co-author and name. We need people who are gonna to go to the mat for us in the, on these issues. And that is what I have done as a council member. I took on the real estate lobby. I took on the landlord lobby and they spent four years trying to recall me because I was such a strong voice for tenant protections. That is not gonna change when I go to Sacramento. I'm going to continue that fight and I'm going to go to the mat on these issues. I'm going to make sure that I'm not just carrying it in name. I'm going to go around. I'm going to lobby my, my colleagues uh, who are on these different committees. I'm going to work and build coalition with ACE, with Courage California, making sure that we, that people know that we are going to try to get progressives in that stand with the community on these key issues. We are going to call the question and not just let our bills become two-year bills. Uh, I was talking with assembly member Alex Lee and one of the things we have to do is we have to build strength in numbers in the Capitol when we have multiple people going to the mat on these issues, calling the question and building coalitions within the Capitol, we will build 
uh, build the movement, we will actually get these things across the finish line. And that is what has to happen. Um, it's not enough that one or two legislators are saying, I'm not taking corporate money. I haven't taken corporate money, um, but it's, it's important that we have more people like us there in the Capitol doing this work. I've seen the difference that it makes on city council when a council member brings that referral and brings the legislation forward and calls the question officially. Thank you. Um, Mia? I think the way that uh, we get a progressive agenda in Sacramento passed is by making sure that we're building coalitions inside, around, uh, and, and all throughout the building. So the first thing is that we need to ensure that the outside game is strong, uh, where we have advocacy organizations, service organizations, and individuals that are impacted across the state coming together to be able to lobby their legislators. Uh, the power of an individual voice and the power of uh, hundreds of thousands of voices are incredibly important. And I think part of what happens is that we have some of that happening in Northern California and we don't have it replicated to the extent that we need to uh, in Southern California particularly as it relates to housing and housing justice. Uh, we need to make sure that we're winning the hearts and minds of our, uh, of our fellow legislators, uh, not be calling them corporate Democrats because that's not gonna, uh, that alienates people, it doesn't bring people in. So a calling in needs to be happening with our legislators so that they know uh, that they're being responsive to their constituents by addressing some of the issues that we've really we've talked about in terms of housing justice, housing affordability and tenants rights. And we need to ensure that we're uh, not gonna back down um, and particularly as we in, in the East Bay are representing black and brown uh, communities, we need to ensure that our, our voice is powerful um, and that is heard. And you need, in order to be able to do that, you need representation that has the ability to represent the concerns and the progressive agenda and also work with the people who are standing in our way. Thank you. And Jenny. Firstly, we need to elect more lawmakers that represent our people, lawmakers that are corporate free and not beholden in special interest groups. So much of our housing legislation goes to die in committee, not because of Republicans, but because of Democrats who don't understand the needs of tenants because they're landlords themselves. And this is the beginning of a possible transformation in our state government. This is the last special election for this year, but we have 34 seats in blue districts open next year. So we have the ability starting right now with this special election to and not to elect legislators who are pro-tenant, who are pro-justice and not just progressive on paper. And the way in which I would work with my fellow lawmakers to inspire people to enact progressive policies is to showcase the stories of the individuals who drove me to run for this seat. There is never a day that goes by where I don't forget the stories of the teen moms experiencing domestic violence and homelessness and sitting on the streets without an opportunity to get shelter. I remember the stories and I remember the specific laws and state systems that failed them. And I will make sure that my fellow lawmakers understand this too, because finally, these are not just progressive issues anymore. The inequalities in the course of this pandemic that have been going on for decades have been laid bare in this moment. What gives me hope is that in when discussing SB 91 and the rental uh, the flawed rental relief program, there was a Republican lawmaker who said tenants' rights might be a progressive issue, but all I know is that my constituents are being evicted in the middle of the pandemic and I need them protected. For these answers. Um, I don't know, is it getting, is it heating up for y'all? I don't know, is it just me? These are really good questions and really good answers. Uh, so question number seven will be asked also by Irene from Courage, California. Thank you, Carol. So to round up this uh, last prepared question section, um, what do you see as the most pressing environmental issue in this district and how do you plan to address it in the state legislature? And the order of responses will come from Mia, Janani, and Malia. I think uh, the reality is that we have in this district uh, severe kind of environmental justice issues uh, that are fa that we're facing because of the diesel truck emissions that are coming from the port, because of the tailpipe emissions and ground ground up rubber and asphalt that comes from traffic and, and the lead contamination that we have in our soil in our soil and in our homes uh, from uh, abatement that just hasn't been put into place over, over generations. Uh, 
as children are dealing with toxic air uh, breaking out in rashes and uh, and experiencing everything related to what it means to be in, living in West Oakland or in East Oakland, uh, we need to make sure that we're focused on the environmental justice components of that. Um, we need to make sure that we're not driving big rigs through West Oakland in our freeways and uh, ensuring that the Port of Oakland is acting responsibly and that the Oakland Airport is as one of the largest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions and pollution on the ground um, are checked in what they do. Uh, we need to ensure that we have a, a common way for us to be able to measure and understand the disparate impact uh, and that it is totally transparent uh, and that the state actually takes responsibility for, um, for the kinds of uh, environmental inequities that we've been able to experience in our, that we've had to endure and experience in our cities. Uh, we wake up with, 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 with orange skies and choking air and, um, and we suffer from cancer and asthma and all of these environmental impacts that are, are part of our district because of the, because of the, uh, because of the overall um, industrial use that we that we have in our in our district. Johnny. The realities in this district is that a black child in West Oakland is six times more likely to have asthma. West and parts of East Oakland have 46% more nitrogen dioxide in the rest of the Bay Area. So we need to not just think about a carbon neutral California, we need to think about the equity lens in all of this. So I do support a Green New Deal that will create hundreds of thousands of clean energy jobs, but I want to make sure that these jobs do and these emission-free transit vehicles and these emission-free buses uh, and trucks don't just go to the hills, but prioritize the communities that are suffering, suffering the brunt of environmental racism, including the many zip codes right here in this district first. I also believe we need to hold corporate polluters accountable. It is a tragedy that AB 260 uh, died this year. And part of that reason is because 70% of our lawmakers accept oil and gas money. 95% of our lawmakers accept PG&E money, which has been held criminally liable for recklessly endangering people's lives. Finally, we need to ban the transportation for, of coal, create buffer zones on fracking along the lines of SB 467. Um, and I'm proud to work alongside coalitions within this district, including CBE Action, including No Coal in Oakland, including the Sunrise Movement, who aren't just pro-climate change and reducing emissions, which is critical, but pro-environmental justice and looking at environmental justice as a racial issue, as an economic justice issue, and as a public health issue. Thank you. And last but not least on this question, Malia. I am one of the kids who grew up in this district next to one of our freeways. I am one of the kids who has asthma uh, as a result of growing up next to our freeways. Um, we have seen our thoroughfares, uh, which are producing over 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions running through our flatlands and running through our communities of color. And I want that to change. I have two young children. I have a two-year-old and a soon-to-be four-month-old, and I do not want them growing up with the dirty air that we have. I do not want them growing up uh, having to worry about the risk of lead poisoning. Um, that's why I serve on Alameda County Healthy Homes Board. Uh, we oversee these issues and we've been working very diligently on them, trying to get things passed like mandatory blood lead testing that's fully funded by the state of California so that we know uh, and our families know and can combat that. Um, it's why I'm carrying legislation before th that same board that we pass a race and equity policy uh, similar to the city of Oakland so that when decisions like how we spend the lead paint settlement money come before us, we can ensure that the money actually goes to those who need it the most uh, to remediate our properties. And I also want to make sure that we have community representation on our air quality boards. We need to expand that access, which is why I supported SB 342 and why Senator Lena Gonzalez has endorsed me for this race. Um, we also need to make sure that we're funding fleet upgrades through corporate accountability taxes, taxing our highest polluters, and making sure that we have transparency around who is causing that pollution. Outstanding, and we've made it through our first set of questions. And so now we are going to questions from our audience. So we have um, people queued up, ready to go. And our first question is from Chris Miller of ACE. 
Hi, this is Christine again. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, first, uh, are you a landlord? That's one of the questions. And do you support a rental registry for Oakland and statewide? So those are two, three questions then. Are you a landlord? Do you support an Oakland rent registry? And do you support a statewide rent registry? And the answers will be in the order of Janani, Malia, and Mia. Yeah, uh, first question, I am not a landlord, I am a tenant. Second and third, yes, I support a local rent registry and a statewide rent registry. So I don't know if these are yes or no questions or elaborations. Well, we are actually giving each candidate 90 seconds to speak. So if you would like to elaborate, you have the opportunity to do so. Yeah, um, I believe that rental registries are essential to part of transparency. There are, like I referenced earlier, a lot of the issues that go on, that have been going on during the pandemic, um, leading tenants to be evicted is not necessarily always notice is served to someone's doors and, and UDs being issued in court, but it's about this uh, the harassment that takes place. It's about the unknown of what landlords are actually doing in a rental registry is not a panacea, but is one step in the process to more accountability and transparency um, among landlords. Um, having served on the Oakland City of Oakland Public Ethics Commission, I'm well aware of um, what goes on and the corruption that happens among building code inspectors and landlords that own multiple properties in the city. I've represented tenants in Oakland um, experiencing um, eviction from many of these landlords that own not one or two, but dozens of properties across the city. And um, a rental registry, again, is not going to be a be all solution, but is part of, I believe, the process to help. Thank you. And Malia. I am not a landlord. Uh, I have too much student loan debt for that. Uh, in terms of rental registries, uh, that was a big fight here in the city of Alameda. And I think that the city of Oakland, if Alameda can do it, so can the city of Oakland. We have a rent reg rental registry. Um, that was part of the legislation that I pushed forward, fought for, and got enacted. Um, it needs to go part and parcel with making sure that we have uh, legal representation also for our tenants. Uh, so I wholeheartedly support not just a rental registry in the city of Oakland. I think it should be in every community and statewide. And I think, again, if we can do it in the city of Alameda, then we can do it statewide and we need to do it statewide because it allows for transparency and it makes sure that we, all, we keep everybody honest. Thank you. And Mia. I am a landlord. I was thankfully able to scrape together every single cent I had to be able to make sure that I had the ability to have space to be able to house my mother and my mother-in-law um, who contribute to spaces uh, who contribute to spaces that uh, to, to our overall mortgage as a family, um, but that technically makes me a landlord. Um, I also have been a renter for 30 years uh, and have been a renter at the time in my life when I didn't have the ability to have uh, a, a, the, or my mother to have the ability to have protections. So tenant protections are incredibly important to me, which is why I absolutely support a rental registry in um, in Oakland and believe that we should have that uh, across the state as well. I think it, it gives us gives tenants um, uh, more access to to power and, and through transparency to understand how uh, how our landlords are operating and to require landlords to be able to indicate what property they have, uh, how they're uh, how they're pacing and uh, focusing on their rental payments uh, and allows tenants to have information that we don't have. Uh, and I also think that we need to be able to have a strong tenant support network right now, um, even with the registry, if you don't have the ability to fight back when you see that harm is being done, um, it's not like you, you actually have the ability to, to do anything about it. So it's important to be able to build up our infrastructure for tenant protections as well in terms of legal representation, ombudsman um, and transparency of, of information sharing so that it's not so hard to be able to fight for your right to be able to have a roof over your head. Thank you. Our next question is from Katie Galanos. 
Yes, this also is a, a few different questions, so I'll go slow. Um, are you accepting contributions from corporations? Are there any sources or special interests from which you will not accept contributions? And which ones? Any order of those responses will be from Malia, Mia, and Janani. Uh, I have not accepted corporate uh, contributions. In fact, I've turned down a couple of them. Uh, I do not take money from the fossil fuel industry. I do not take money from tobacco. I do not take money uh, from uh, landlords. Uh, I do not take money from um, a, a number of different other types of corporations uh, that have that have offered uh, offered contributions to me. Thank you for that answer. And Mia? I have taken corporate contributions. I do believe that we need to ensure that we're uh, focused on reforming our public finance and our public campaigning system to be able to make it affordable for everybody to be able to run. Uh, I have not taken any money, nor will I ever, from police. I've not taken money from any fossil fuel uh, agencies or, or programs or lobbyists. I don't take any money from tobacco and I don't take any money from big soda. Thank you. And Janani. I am a corporate free candidate. I do not accept funds from any um, corporations. I have actively rejected thousand dollar contributions and returned them from corporations in the past. I've taken the homes guarantee pledge to make sure that housing is not a commodity, but a human right, which means I don't accept money from any kind of uh, from uh, from real estate developers. Um, I've also taken the Green New Deal and, and no fossil fuel money pledges, which means I don't accept money from the fossil fuel industry, police unions, prison guard unions, big pharma, any corporations that uh, contract with ICE or billionaires. Thank you for those questions and thank you for those answers. And our next question is from Nicole Dean. Sorry, I'm having some technical issues. You can see me, okay. Um, my question is, do you believe that the police keep us safe? What non-police approaches for dealing with crime in the district would you pursue if elected? And how will you push back on and or work with the police officer association? So we are asking all of the easy questions tonight. And the answers will be in the order of Mia, Janani, and Malia. Uh, I don't believe that the police keep us safe. I think that the structure of policing that has been set up has actually been built on on white supremacist uh, framework and ideology. And uh, as a child of somebody who whose father was actually shot by police and injured by police during a political action, I have a very odd, uh, untrusting relationship with police, quite frankly. Um, I think that one of the ways that we support uh, reconstructing our public safe safety system is uh, by taking funds that were that, that police have uh, that they don't need, um, where they're showing up in public spaces that don't us, allow us to be feeling protected um, and, and ensuring that they're addressing violent crimes as the, their top priority and where their funding should actually be placed to be. I think that it's important that we uh, focus on alternative violence prevention programs. Um, there's so much work that Oakland has been doing that I think has a, an ability to be a model for the state, quite frankly, in addition to ensuring that we have first responders uh, that are based in care and uh, in mental health provision and resources, and to ensure that we have the ability to have uh, non-police uh, agencies and entities like the transportation department, the parks and rec department, uh, be involved in, in public spaces so that when we're out and about and we're doing our shopping and we're at the vendors market or, or, or a community market, uh, we can feel safe in our personhood walking down any street in the, city, in the state of California and certainly within our district. Thank you for sharing that. And our, our next respondent is Janani. Uh, firstly, 
say his name, Mario Gonzalez, say his name, Eric Salgado, say his name, Stephen Taylor. Police do not keep us safe. We can. And I want to work to a world where police and the carceral system are not the solution to violence. I have spent my career working with individuals experiencing mental health crisis, uh, people who are unhoused, and survivors of domestic violence. And all of these communities and so many others are people that are repeatedly harmed and re-traumatized and criminalized by our police force. So firstly, I would work towards supporting cities' ability to defund and reinvest in solutions that actually work. Only 4% of OPD's time is actually spent addressing violent crimes, and we need to uh, uh, move the majority of current police funding and support cities' ability to transfer the majority of their funding into alternative programs. And second, I know that alternative programs worked um, having been a, having been a part of three organizations in this district including men creating peace mh first and, and a couple of others that do life-saving work to prevent community violence not just put a band-aid over the problem after violence has already happened i've been a part of coalitions in this district that have fought for funding for these alternative programs including the crisis act which unfortunately because our governor wanted to house a um funding to address violence as a public health crisis, but instead put it under CDCR because of this flawed flaw in thinking about how we really address community violence, it wasn't passed. Thank you. And I just, um, before we get to the next question, we've gone through several. I want to just say you all are staying on time extremely well. It's very difficult to do, so thank you. Um, and the final respondent, Malia. Uh, I'm in fact going to be missing a forum tomorrow night because I am working on this issue in real time at the local level as an elected council member. It's been an issue. Um, I, I just want to say, first of all, we keep us safe. That's just a fact. We know that. Um, it's not the police. The police does, it does not exist to keep every one of us safe. And in fact, we have used the police. We have seen the police used uh, and militarized uh, in order to cause harm. Uh, specifically to black and brown bodies. Um, I wanna clarify, I also don't take money from police unions or from police. Uh, and uh, in fact, I have uh, voted to demilitarize our local police uh, to sell the tank that our former assembly member uh, in one of his last actions as a council member uh, purchased, uh, make sure and try to you know, use those funds to fund programs that we know work um, make sure that we are right-sizing our departments. Oftentimes, law enforcement like to carry a number of vacancies, uh, which they can then use to buy toys uh, and things to militarize uh, or to uh, add on and, and pay for things like new uh, academies so they can bolster their ranks. Um, I think we need to center BIPOC voices in this process, uh, which is what I have done at the local level. Uh, and then we need to fund things like alternatives uh, to responses in alternatives relative to dispatching, we need to retrain our dispatchers to not send uh, armed responses. We need to fund set sending uh, clinicians uh, and, and uh, first responders uh, to these calls for service and take the money out of CDCR and Department of Justice. Thank you all for those answers. And our last question of the evening is, Dun, 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 what is it? How do all of the candidates stand on the proposed stadium A's deal with the Howard term for Howard Terminal? I believe there's a better way to articulate that, but that is the question that I'm seeing um, in the chat that's also in our list of questions here. And um, after our final question, then I will invite the candidates to ask, to, to provide their closing remarks, um, their uh, two minute remarks. So where do you stand on the proposal to build a new A stadium at Howard Terminal? And uh, I do not have a, an order for that. So Juan, if you could help me with that, that would be amazing. Yeah, of course. On my agenda, I have Janani, then Malia, and then Mia. Outstanding. 
I was the first candidate of this race who took an uncompromising, clear and public stand in opposition to the Howard Terminal, because having visited the Howard Terminal, having spoken with West Oakland community groups, I have seen why it is both unfeasible to and harmful to our community members, our environment and our industry. I'm proud to have spoken up about this at planning commission meetings, be a member of the Coliseum Task Force and stand alongside ILW you, Oakland East Bay Democratic Club, Oakland Tenants Union, all of whom ha are, have endorsed me in this race in their solidarity with West Oakland residents, port workers, and local small businesses to oppose this project. And I will continue to do so um, and noted that I opposed this project back when it was incredibly unpopular to do so, face the criticism that I did because that is the kind of lawmaker that I want to be. If I see an injustice and I believe in the cause, I am going to speak up about it no matter how unpopular that might make me. And I oppose it because because this is not about community development. This is about billionaire interests. I oppose this because it threatens one third of 85,000 well paid unionized jobs, primarily longshoremen at the ILWU. And when we lose this business, our economy is going to be at stake. I oppose this because this is not just a project about a sports stadium. This is a project about 3,000 market rate condominiums. And I, of course, oppose this because of the over $1 billion of taxpayer money that this is going to impose and particularly a graduated tax on West Oakland residents. And Juan, who was our second speaker? Respondent. The next one will be Malia. Thank you. So I support keeping the A's in Oakland. Uh, I support uh, uh, the concept of uh, a project that would involve them at Howard Terminal. Um, but I wanna clarify that I want to see a robust public process that is transparent. I want to see community involvement. Uh, I want to make sure that there is no displacement, that there is an agreement put in place um, that any tenants that would potentially be displaced by this project um, that there is that there is a place for them to come back to, that those units are rent controlled. I wanna see below market units. I wanna see affordable units uh, come in to this project. Uh, I also wanna see the creation of good union jobs. Um, and I wanna see infrastructure investment that is 10 years delayed. Uh, there is infrastructure asks uh, going on right now as part of the state budget that are 10 years old um, that would allow for us to move a lot of the port transit away from our homes. Uh, we need to do that. We need to make sure that we are moving these things uh, and separating them from where we have residential. Um, but I also do not want to see a parking lot uh, in this in this uh, at Howard Terminal uh, that is essentially creating more greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which is what currently is occurring there. Or could occur there if we don't see the Howard Terminal project come through. Um, so I want to see uh, community benefits. I want to see investment, not just money leaving the community. And I want to see reinvestment in OUSD. And I want to see the community being involved. I want to see our renters uh, having a voice. Thank you. And Mia. I think the Howard Terminal uh, project uh, for the A's involves two big critical questions. One is uh, what, what is actually happening at the Port of Oakland and recognizing that still the Port of Oakland uh, ha is still a significant polluter. Um, and as I previously talked about, it's still incredibly frustrating that uh, we don't have us all talking about the expanded operations and how they pollute uh, instead of building more housing, community benefits, transportation infrastructure, and yes, an A stadium for the Oakland A's. Um, I want to see the Oakland A's stay in in the city of Oakland, I think it's important that we have um, that kind of pride of, uh, of, of, of a team here. Uh, I think that they wanna stay here. And I also think that uh, we need to make sure that uh, the deal that they made originally that they talked about is actually the deal that happens. And I think that involves making sure that we have a full uh, review and, and sequel process that isn't rushed or expedited um, and that people can actually fully engage in uh, and, and and within the time frame that was set out in the legislation that was passed originally about this uh, and that we ensure uh, as the plan originally called for that we have affordable housing so that we can ensure um, that uh, that that doesn't become a, a place for multimillionaires, which I don't think is that was the original intent and it's not the way it should go down in the city of Oakland.
Thank you. Thank you for all of those answers. These are, these are not tough, tough, um, well, they're not, they're not easy to answer. And that is what we do here at ACE Oakland and ACE statewide is, is ask the tough questions. We're looking for answers that really address the needs of our membership base. And we're just one organization, only a few thousand members, but we're still just one organization. And we appreciate um, the fact that you all came here tonight. And I would be, um, I, Juan, what time are we supposed to end this evening? We're scheduled to end at eight. So we're a little bit behind. We're a little bit behind. So each candidate will have um, two minutes for their closing remarks, but I would be remiss to not ask one of the pressing questions that my membership base right here in the city of Oakland has been asking repeatedly. Um, and that is the question around Oakland Promise. Can we please get some clarity around the ethics issues surrounding accommodations given Oakland Promise at City Hall? This is from um, one of the um, participants, Risa Jaffe, in the Q&A. And it's something that I, I think needs clarity. It comes up all of the time. So, um, and we can take that. Juan, help me with the order because I lost track on the last two questions. Um, but that would be very, very helpful for me right now. I'm also um, trying to check what the order would be. So it looks like it would be uh, Malia, then Mia, then Janani. Thank you. Um, so I, I don't know how to answer this question other than to say that I know these questions have been asked multiple times. Um, I certainly think that the expenditure of any city funds uh, needs to be transparent. Uh, it needs to be part of an articulated budget process that is reviewed by the people. It's the people's money uh, and then is voted on in a transparent manner. Um, and, and there needs to be accountability and auditing relative to tracking any uh, use of public funds to make sure that there is a public benefit. Um, and, the, and to make sure that it's in line with the pe people's budget. Um, oftentimes the city of Oakland uh, in particular is up against a, a number of pressing costs and there are um, a, you know, a number of community investment needs. Uh, and so it really needs to be reviewed by the council uh, in full uh, and part of a transparent budget process. And I know that in the past, um, there have been questions raised by council members about the use of city funds, uh, the use of city staff time, uh, and that it was eventually uh, seen that the the nonprofit that it had to be part of a nonprofit that was created separately, but there's still significant uh, public expenditures of uh, thousands of dollars of Oakland money uh, going specifically into this nonprofit. Uh, when we could see corporations and other nonprofits donate, since it is a, a 501c3 rather than uh, the use of city funds, when we often see a budget deficit and we need to see reinvestment in social services and the community at large. Mia, you can you can go ahead and answer. I see you've unmuted. Uh, I've been writing Oakland Promise for the last two years. I helped to stand up Oakland Promise as an independent 501c3 uh, to be able to do that. Since I've been a part of Oakland Promise, we've actually run five audits and uh, have asked and answered any questions about uh, this issue, as has the city attorney, as has the city auditor, uh, where you will find that uh, in all of those uh, recollections uh, during the establishment of the 501c3, uh, that Oakland Promise is doing what it is intended to do and the city funds have been afforded to uh, to Oakland Promise go towards children, go towards ensuring that children have scholarships that there are available to them, uh, that they have uh, college savings accounts that are available to them uh, so that they can go to uh, go on to pursue college. Uh, there have been no misappropriation of Oakland Promises funds uh, other than to be able to, none at all, and other than to be able to ensure that children get the resources that they need to be able to achieve their post-secondary dreams. And my role has been a part of making sure that Oakland Promise is a stand-up, fully accountable, fully transparent organization. Thank you for that answer. And Janani. 
I would love more clarity on Open Promise, how it was founded, by what funds it was founded, how much funding is it, its executives have made and currently make, and who, who donates and what special interests any of those donors hold. Having served on the City of Oakland Public Ethics Commission, I am grateful for the hundreds of community members who spoke up about this issue, the whistleblowers that have brought issues regarding Open, Open Promise to the limelight. Thanks to these um, powerful community members and whistleblowers, um, the city auditor decided to launch an investigation. The Oakland Ethics Commission decided to launch an investigation. It's unacceptable that we have a nonprofit that was housed under Oakland taxpayer money without city council authorization for over two years. It is unacceptable that the former pseudo director of education or whatever the title was earned a salary of over $300,000 a year. That is Oakland taxpayer money. That is money that should be going to our children um, and has not had been able to flow in the ways that it should. And I'm also shocked at the fact that Measure AA, which dedicated, um, a, which a third of which is parcel tax money, um, was deemed passed by city council members and that sitting assembly members have encouraged council members to deem it passed, even though that this measure did not get the two thirds of the vote that it legally needed, which a judge formerly clarified after. And like any other government related nonprofit or government agency, I believe in a full transparency and ethics and that taxpayer and public and community money belong to us, our children and our futures, not executives. And thank you for these answers. And so because we are over time, I'm going to roll right into our closing statements. And because Mia went first, I'm keeping track in my brain now. The uh, first speaker in their closing remarks will be Malia, and then we will go to Janani, and then Mia. I think that's right. Juan, did I do that right? Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and thank you to Courage, uh, the Courage Campaign, and ACE for holding this forum tonight uh, and asking the tough questions of us. That's why we are running, that's why I'm running, is to make sure that the tough questions uh, get the community-based, values-based uh, leadership uh, and response that they deserve. Uh, I have been a fighter for working families uh, for my entire professional career. I've been a legal advocate for children and youth. I've advocated for people uh, with mental health issues. I have made sure that working people get fair pay, uh, safe working conditions, and a right to organize on the job. Uh, I have taken these values to city council and transformed and made Alameda a more progressive, welcoming community. We still have significant work to do, um, but I'm there calling the question every single time we have a council meeting, making sure that there is a voice uh, for folks in our community who have oftentimes been overlooked. Um, and I'm gonna take that fight to Sacramento. I have not taken corporate money. I have worked very hard uh, in coalition to be successful at legislating for things like tenant protections, increasing the minimum wage, making sure that we have equitable responses to the COVID-19 pandemic, and also making sure that we build affordable housing. We've built 25% inclusionary affordable housing here in Alameda. Uh, we've built more housing in the last four years than we have in the last two decades. And that's because I'm there speaking truth to power, pushing these issues, building the coalition and the groundswell from the ground up. Uh, and I would love to have your support. It's going to take all of us to make a difference. I'm willing to go to the mat on these issues that are of utmost importance to all of us. It's why I'm the only candidate endorsed by the Legislative Women's Caucus, the API Caucus, uh, Oakland Rising Action, Bay Rising Action, Latino Task Force, the Coalition on Police Accountability, State Controller Betty Yee, and many, many others. Uh, and I hope you'll join me in this fight. Thank you. Wonderful. Did I just say wonderful? That's a new word because I can make stuff up. So, um, Janani. In this special election, we have the choice of making sure that progressive legislation that actually truly centers the voices of tenants and our community members doesn't just go to die in committee because of lawmakers that are bought by the power of corporate, corporate contributions in the way that these corporations buy elections. I promise to never make empty promises and just sit there and say housing is a human right, yet fail to enact legislation that takes action on these issues. I promise 
to never make the excuse that developers and the landlord lobbies are just too powerful. So I'm not, I'm not even going to try to fight for change. I am never going to make that excuse. And I promise to also not be the kind of lawmaker that just sits in Sacramento and says yes to bills. As a tenant, and if elected, I would be just one out of three tenants out of 120 lawmakers. As a tenant, I will continue to be an active member of the three Oakland-based tenant unions that I'm part of. I will continue to engage in public activism, march alongside all of you, because legislation only coupled with movements and people power is how we build change. And I'm driven to run for this seat, not because of titles and of powers and the ability to rise up ladders. I am driven to run because of the elderly tenants of Oakland that I've represented from being evicted, even in the middle of this pandemic. I'm driven to run because of the real eviction defense I've participated to protect unhoused community members during this pandemic from being ripped apart from their homes. What drives me are the, are the stories of these individuals, of the communities that I belong to, and I refuse to sit there and stand back and become a state that allows our unhoused population of 160,000 people to grow. I refuse to sit and stand back and allow Oakland to lose its Black population because of gentrification by 25% in over 20 years. I will refuse to sit back and allow tens of thousands of Californians behind on rent this month, unable to take advantage of SB 91, be evicted the day after the special election. So join our movement, jenny4ca.com. Thank you. And Mia Bonta. I'm Mia Bonta. I'm a proud Black Latino who was raised by a single mother, and I raised three kids here in the East Bay uh, with my husband. I've experienced racism, sexism, and I'm not afraid to call out white supremacy in policing, housing, schools, and our environments. I know that climate crisis is real, and I'm running because it's time to act. I hope you'll join me in building a better, more sustainable East Bay for our next generation, because we deserve it. We deserve legislators who actually dig into facts and actually share facts instead of spew top lines that are just blatant lies. Uh, we deserve legislators who are willing to build coalitions. We deserve legislators who have the experience and know-how of what it means to represent a community and represent that community strongly and proudly within the legislature, who has the past experience of passing legislation, working on legis workshopping legislation that has made a difference in this, in this district. My experience and values have earned me the endorsement, including labor organizations like the California Teachers Association, California School Employees Association, CSEA, uh, SEIU, California, BUAPA, the California Legislative Black Caucus, and the Latino Caucus. Um, and I'm proud to have the endorsement and support of council members Trevor Reed, Lauren Taylor, Shang Tao, Noel Gallo, and Dan Cal, as well as the uh, exclusive endorsement of Congresswoman Barbara Lee. I invite you to be a part of what we can create together. Thank you all for coming, the, the three of you. It, for, for me, honestly, it really is good to see women of color um, running for this position. It is tough and you gotta get through the tough questions in order to do the hard work. I wanna thank everyone who uh, tuned in to be a part of this, all the attendees watching from home, people who ask questions. We didn't even get to all of the questions that were in the Q&A, but we got the first first two. Um, to the interpreter, to all of the or event organizers, forum facilitators, uh, our uh, moderator, which is me. I gotta give thanks to myself. No, I'm kidding, that's irrelevant. Um, and, and honestly, deeply from the bottom of my heart for all of the candidates who, who have the courage and energy and um, the just what it takes to get up and put yourself out there to be torn apart by every and anybody. Thank you all for doing what you're doing right now. Um, Assembly 18 is a rich and diverse district of Oakland, San Leandro and Alameda. And we deserve an assembly member that is going to represent every single one of our diverse communities, every single one of us. And that's not easy. So for all the people that are listening, to all the people who are watching or are gonna watch later, make your voice be heard in this election, send in your ballots by June 29th. And if it's important to know that if no candidate secures a majority of the vote, the top two vote getters will advance to the runoff for an August election. So know what you're talking about. If you need support in that, holler at ACE, ACE Action or the Courage Campaign 
once again, I appreciate you all for showing up and it's a wrap. Good night. Thank you for coming.